All right, welcome to Quick Show. This is the first of several uh, episodes we're going to do in a series on liberation theology. The title of this uh, includes the idea of the threat of liberation theology. I'm going to cover that somewhat in this episode, but we're going to be covering that more in the series as we move forward. Liberation theology, to me, when you look at critical social justice, wokeness, right? That is this religion of academia that is entering the culture and taking over all of the institutions and and taking over culture. It The, the one bastion you would think that would hold out from something like this would be religion, Christianity. But that's not the case. And it is being brought in along with the other institutions to fall in line with this religion of academia, which again is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, how do you do that? Well, a lot of people believe that the hard left is just going to break down religion and, and, and destroy it and get rid of it. And that might be part of the objective if you look at the original DNA of hard leftism, right, and look, in, look into Marxism. However, there's an easier way to do it. And it seems to be something that has happened this way over and over again in churches, where instead of getting rid of Christianity, you simply insert a virus and you change it. The host, which is Christianity, becomes something different. The host, which is Christ, if in our minds, if we put a virus into what the doctrine of Christ is, it becomes something different. That's what liberation theology is about. It's like a virus that comes in and changes the doctrine of Christ. I've got a video I'm going to go over here. We're going to cover a couple of different things that are happening in Christianity more broadly, and then I'm going to wrap it up going coming back here to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. A couple of comments here on what liberation theology is first. Liberation theology is where it, it looks back on human history and not on our cosmic order, so to speak, like the gospel that we have. It looks back on history, and it says that this history is the theater in which the drama of liberation, the new type of salvation, is realized. All right? It's going back to history, looking at the injustices, and then trying to save history by, well, saving our future by critiquing the justice that may not have occurred in, in our history. It is said that God is no longer, in, in critical justice, it, it is said that God is no longer merely above history. He himself is in it, in that he is also constantly in front of it as its free, uncontrolled future. This is Johannes Metz. Okay, so again, what you have here with the idea of liberation this fits in as part of a, a process of change. It's constantly constantly looking for change. When we think about social justice, right, and, and, and the new type of justice, what that means is constant change. It's not just a matter of bringing some type of equilibrium. It's a matter of creating a change in the future. You need activism, praxis, to be able to do that. It's following the, the Hegelian dialectic, right? Where you come in with the thesis and, and let's call that the doctrine of Christ, the true doctrine of Christ right now. And then an antithesis, let's call that liberation theology in this instance. And then you compromise somewhere in the middle and you end up with a synthesis. And you're going to start seeing this. I've already started seeing this in academia, in the church, in Mormon studies, where you start bringing in this, 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 this liberation theology where there's some truths to it, but it's more of a synthesis. 
right, between what we might call Savior theology or the theology of Jesus Christ, the true gospel, and, and, and liberation theology, and then there's kind of a mixture that's being brought in here. And we're going to go over examples of that as we go through the series. It's kind of like con a continual moving of spiritual goalposts toward a different end. And that end is, I believe, liberation theology. What, does, what is the end for Christianity in regards to critical social justice? Where does that all end? I believe it ends with liberation theology. In liberation theology, the meaning of the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes that of a social institution, which adds a critical voice to many others. A critical voice of others of a liberal social order. In other words, they're, they're critiquing, they're deconstructing, they're tearing down a liberal social order like the West or like Savior theology. Its objective is the new liberation of man. This is very much like Marcuse, the Marxist of, of Frankfurt, the Frankfurt School. It's the same thing, same idea. Its objective is the new liberation of man or of a racial group from the oppressors of the world. It decenters the doctrine of Christ from one of personal repentance, faith in the atonement, and a spiritual relationship with a Savior to a doctrine portraying Jesus Christ as a political Messiah and temporal liberator of the captives from their oppressors. In other words, it replaces a Savior theology with a liberator theology. The result of this is a new target for the godly attributes of faith, hope, and charity. Faith in the atonement becomes faith in activism. Hope in Christ becomes hope in change. You heard that before? Charity for God and for our fellow man becomes love for the struggle to bring authentic liberation liberation to others. It's also the antithesis of gathering Israel and becoming one. It is divisive, highly divisive, because you always have to have the breakdown of the oppressors and the oppressed. That never goes away. The goalposts simply move. With the idea of gathering Israel, which is something we're very focused on in the church right now, that idea is what we might call assimilation. Assimilation to what? Assimilation to a Zion people. Assimilation to a set of commandments and behaviors that help create a Zion people and where we are following Christ, becoming like him. This is a term that Ibram Kendi uses. And we're going to go over the example of Ibram Kendi here because I think of all, all characters, all individuals that would have an influence on liberation theology, I believe that Ibram Kendi will have the greatest influence, even though he's not one of the founders of liberation theology. He is the most popular, most read critical race theorist there is. And he is deeply rooted in liberation theology. We're going to go over that in just a second. But for him, an assimilation to these types of principles is an assimilation to whiteness. And therefore, it is racist. And you are either racist or you are anti-racist. And you're going to see something very interesting about what he says here in this video about Savior theology, our theology. Something that is not brought up much about Ibram Kendi is that in the opening of his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, he focuses immediately on his parents who become members of the ideology of black liberation theology. This is where Ibram Kendi grows up. He is deeply rooted in liberation theology. This is where his anti-racism his critical race theory, in a sense, comes from. And it's not spoken of much. 
So Ibram Kendi starts off his book by talking about the introduction of liberation theology to his parents. And this is how language in the Bible, for example, is used in liberation theology. He talks about Tom Skinner, and, who was a, a, a charismatic preacher in the 20th century. And, and his parents were led to him. He quotes Skinner as saying, there was a system working just like today. Jesus was dangerous. He was dangerous because he was changing the system. It's like systemic racism. This is where he's pulling this from. The Romans locked up this revolutionary and nailed him to a cross and killed and buried him. But three days later, Jesus Christ got up out of the grave to bear witness to us today. Quote, proclaim liberation to the captives. It's like we get out of Isaiah. Preach sight to the blind and go into the world and tell men who are bound mentally, spiritually, and physically, the liberator has come. So what happens is, is with the doctrine of Christ, you have the, the ideas of, of Gethsemane, the cross, and the resurrection. Instead of us having a hope again in, in Christ and in, in the events of those three events, primarily in Gethsemane and then, of course, in the resurrection, instead of that being about our repentance, about a personal relationship with Christ, about a faith in him being our savior, those events come to be seen as the oppressors killed him and then he came uh, out as a, as a resurrected being and overthrew, in a sense, that, that, uh, that killing of him, right? That he is now, that the resurrection is more of a, an overcoming of the oppressors of those that nailed him to the cross. And so just like we set up our own gods for whatever our desires are or our ideologies are, this is what liberation theology is in essence. It sets up a God, Jesus Christ, as the liberator, a liberator over the temporal oppressors. Kendi says, I quote, my own still ongoing journey toward being an anti-racist. These are terms that are tied very closely. You hear the term anti-racist a lot. It comes from Kendi. He didn't start it, but he has popularized it more than anybody else. And understand what he means by this. My still ongoing journey toward being an anti-racist began at Urbana, 1970. What changed Ma and Dad led to a changing of their two unborn sons. This new definition of the Christian life became the creed that grounded my parents' lives and the lives of their children. Ibram, Ibram Kendi. I cannot disconnect my parents' religious strivings to be Christian from my secular strivings to be an anti-racist. For him... Liberation theology and anti-racism are the same thing. You cannot pull them apart. I have his workbook here, right? This is the workbook for how to be an anti-racist, right? I've gone through the whole workbook so that I could become converted to Ibram Kendi's religion of anti-racism. Not. But again, here is something that he says in the workbook. This new reality... I'm paraphrasing, this new reality of Christianity turned racist and passive racist assimilationists to anti-racists. So again, also in his workbook, he starts off focusing with liberation theology. Now, I want to go through a video clip here that I think you're going to find very interesting. It, it offers a lot of clarity in understanding what anti-racism really is. This is critical race theory. And, and for him, with a Christian background, understand what anti-racism really is. I'm curious if you see any role that churches or communities of faith can play in this anti-racist movement. Sure. So I, yeah, I'm a preacher's kid and, and my parents pretty much met in what was known as the Black Power Movement, but more. Okay, so again, part of what he's talking about here, and it's very interesting that it works this way, 
is that it's identitarian, right? Liberation theology is, is very identitarian, just like critical social justice, just like intersectionality. For him, this is the black power movement. And this leads right into liberation theology for him. More specifically for them, the movement um, for black theology. And so they were both Christians who, who imagined that the church was supposed to be an engine of liberation, that Christianity was supposed to be a source of liberation for black people and humanity. They looked at Jesus as black <laughs> with a fro, like they had their fro. Okay, so this is another thing that's very common, right? It, it's, 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 I'm going to reflect him upon myself, just like white people do the same thing, right? But, it, but Jesus is a black individual uh, in this movement. And in many ways, he, he's black in the sense that he is, he is suffering. That's important to understand, that he is on the margins. That's part of what, in that idea of, of a black Jesus, that's part of what that means. It's not just his skin color. It means that he's on the fringes. He's not part of the heteronormative uh, society. I think one of the ways we can distinguish it is one being liberation theology. There In other go. words, Jesus was a revolutionary. <laughs> and the job of the Christian is to revolutionize society. Okay, so there you go. A couple of things there. The revolution is a very important word. And you get this in all aspects of critical social justice. When you say, well, why, why are people doing this? What is the focus on this? When we talk about those goalposts that are moving, in this case, spiritual goalposts, that is the revolution. That's what the revolution is. And for some, the means to get to that revolution are not important. They will do anything to get to that revolution. Now, in this sense, it's more of a, a spiritual revolution, but it is still rooted in the Marxist revolution. It's the same thing. So one side of this is liberation theology. That the job of the Christian is to liberate society from the powers on, on earth that are oppressing humanity. Everybody understand that? So... Now, what else is interesting here is that he talks about liberating, liberating society. Notice he didn't say liberating you. Now, that's part of it. But, but what happens is you typically end up getting to a collective in this. It's very common that, that, that it's talking more about a collective. In this case, if it's black liberation theology, it's for black individuals. If you go to the liberation theology of, of some Catholic churches in Latin America, it's a class identity not a racial identity. Although down there, it's oftentimes, we, we might call it racial also, those that are more of, of, an, of a, a native blood in Latin America are oftentimes fighting against those that are not as much of a native blood. But it's, it's focused more on a traditional Marxism of class struggle in Latin America. That's liberation theology in a nutshell. Savior theology is a different type of theology. The job of the Christian is to go out and save these individuals, individuals who are behaviorally deficient. Okay, so there's a couple things that come up here. You can see where this lines up with critical race theory and critical social justice. So it's the individuals. You notice he talked about liberation theology of society. He uses the term society. That's going to be the natural thing to say. And then of savior theology, it was of individuals. Why is that important? Because it's a natural distinction. Because with savior theology, you're talking about personal repentance. You're talking about using your agency. You're talking about becoming something else through choices. He is decrying this. He's saying that that is wrong to tell people that they, they're going to need to change their behavior or to assimilate to a certain behavior like the gospel of Jesus Christ might outline. Now, what he goes through here, if you call yourself an anti-racist, 
there's a, there's a 90% chance or higher that the reason you call yourself an anti-racist is because of Ibram Kendi and him popularizing this movement and that word. So consider that as self-identifying as an anti-racist when you hear, hear his words here. And, and to me, anti-racists fundamentally reject savior theology. That go. goes right in line with racist ideas and racist theology in which they say, you know what? Okay, so there you have it. The doctrine of Christ, savior theology, your personal relationship with Christ is completely against anti-racism. So if you identify as an anti-racist or you're looking at an anti-racist movement, understand that the primary proponent of anti-racism, Ibram Kendi himself says that anti-racism is antithetical to the doctrine of Christ, to savior theology, to having a savior of you uh, uh, over your sins. This is not hidden stuff. This is all out there. But nobody really looks into it. In addition, he said that Savior theology, the doctrine of Christ, is racist. So this is what we're using here to lead into our series of liberation theology because Ibram Kendi is the man. He has the background with liberation theology. His anti-racism is rooted in liberation theology. And he's the most popular critical race theorist out there. Now, what about the threat? Well, of course, you know people that would call themselves anti-racist. You can see how this starts to seep into their minds, into their ideas, into their doctrine, into their ideology, into their religion, into their soul where they are saying, this is a part of who I am. And that's what anti-racism requires, is that it requires your heart, might, mind, and strength, just like Christianity does. But again, it is antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ. He outlined it very clearly here. You might say, well, okay, Greg, why is this a threat to the church? Well, you know people in the church that are adopting this religion. It is seeping in everywhere. And, and, and you start hearing things at the, at the ward level, the stake level, where this language of anti-racism and critical race theory is used. It's a virus. And it changes the way we think about things. And ultimately, I believe, it's going to change what we think about the doctrine of Christ. Or... For those that accept it, it's going to change what they think about the doctrine of Christ. An example of this is what we had, as I've gone over previously, is what we have with the professor at BYU. Talking about Ibram Kendi and talking about this book that we've been going over, rooted in liberation theology, this BYU professor says the following. Notice all the books that he starts to drop, right? These are books that he's read and researched, uh, uh, books on black theology, right? If you're interested on in that, you can find information on how to get to that hmm. in Kendi's book. Try to connect people to, I would say, Jesus Christ, especially those that are within our family. And this will be the last thing I'll say. It comes from Kendi's book on page 15 and definitions. He talks about a way of reframing about how we think hmm. about Jesus Christ that was provided by Tom Skinner. So Tom, he was uh, covered him. A, a preacher from Harlem. And he says, um, Jesus was a radical revolutionary with hair on his chest and dirt under his fingernails. Any gospel that does not speak to the issue of enslavement and injustice and inequality any gospel that does not want to go where people are hungry and poverty stricken and set them free in the name of Jesus Christ is not the gospel. So you have a gospel connection. He's reading that out of Ibram Kendi's book. Many of your family members, right? And you can help them reframe the way they think about Christ by you sharing your testimony about how you think about Christ, right? So these conversations are things that 
happen over time. And in the aggregate, we're looking for a shift and a change. I think it's important to understand and be very clear on what he's doing here. He's talking about the students' families. He's talking about reframing Christ into a Kendi Christ, a non-savior Christ, a liberation theology Christ, and having them turn around from BYU and go back to their families and tell them about this new Christ. This is a religion. This is evangelism. This is activism. So a new Jesus, right? A Jesus who fights off the oppressors. A Jesus that isn't as interested in you as an individual and in your merits and in your decisions, your agency. A, a new Jesus who, in liberation theology, is not concerned about come follow me. Now, where else do we see this? We see this throughout Christianity, and I'm going to be giving several examples of this. I have friends in the Southern Baptist Convention. You had resolution number nine that came through in 2019 in their convention that allowed critical race theory to be, as they call, subordinate to Scripture, which is not going to last very long, but could be used as a tool to interpret Scripture. Again, you let the virus in, to the Bible, it's going to affect the host. It's going to change the host. The Church of England is another great example. It is, it is very concerning what is happening there. Where does this all end with critical social justice in Christianity and the restored gospel? I believe it ends in liberation theology. I'll be putting out a new episode in this Liberation Theology series. I'll try to do this about once a week as we go through this. We're going to be covering the Book of Mormon. We're going to be covering the Old Testament. We're going to be covering more examples of Christianity so that we understand and are prepared for what could very well be something that's already happening in other Christian churches. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.